Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one is Big Pharma hiding a cancer cure from us by Phil. Thank you, Phil. Um, this one is like one of those ones where it's like, yeah, I mean, when you put it as like super simple, it's like, yeah, obviously, like curing diseases is uh, not as good for business as treating diseases. So you'd be like, well, it kind of makes sense that they're just like focus on stuff that we need like over the long term and to draw this stuff out rather than just like boom and your cancer is gone so it's like one of those ones that feels like yeah yeah there's a logical reason for it but i imagine it's completely untrue anyway let's see what phil has to say because uh he wrote it let's go dear simon I trust you and your family are keeping well. We are. I appreciate you and your team giving me the opportunity to tackle a topic that concerns me and those who I love in more than one way. The big question I will seek to answer today is whether government agencies, big pharma and big pharma adjacent institutions are hiding the truth about the existence of a cancer cure. I mean, I don't really believe that the government would because the government would be like, you know, not really cut down. Well, at least the, in Britain, you're not really cut down the NHS bill. Not even cancer anymore. That'd <laughs> be really a lot cheaper if we didn't have to deal with that but big pharma be like hey pills expensive pills for life from now on i will simply refer to this as the big cancer plot or bcp as with many conspiracies making the rounds on the press social media or word of mouth the origins are nebulous and the premises are transparently ludicrous ones placed under the torch of rational scrutiny okay fine yeah i'm sure it would be i'm sure there's a reason why all of this is just silly unlike other conspiracies however the bcp can have profound effects on the physical as well as the mental state of those who believe in it especially cancer patients and their loved ones oh my god can you imagine I mean, cancer and believing in this be like i know you're hiding the secret for the cure and it's like we're not we're not i know you are i'm dying because of you and it's like we're working really hard to come up with treatments <laughs> I don't, i'm sorry it would be undoubtedly powerful to quote an array of peer-reviewed papers assessing the magnitude of these effects on a statistically significant number of individuals. But, dear Simon and audience, allow me to quote an equally powerful single piece of literature, a two-panelled comic by therapist and cartoonist Max Muhorter for his series Cancer Owl, which he describes as comics about getting cancer and surviving it, where I draw myself as an owl. Okay. The comic titled Conspiracy is introduced by this caption in the first panel. What you might say to a cancer patient. In the panel, a big anthropomorphic dog dressed as a hippie questions the titular owl on whether he still allows Big Pharma to poison him. The dog patronizes the owl, advising him to eat buttloads of turmeric and drink alkaline water. But pharma companies obviously keep the miracle cure a secret so they can get rich off drug sales. The second panel is introduced with the caption, What a Cancer Patient Probably Hears. The previous situation is repeated, but now the hippie dog's body language shows open contempt towards the owl, and the dog does not mince his words words accusing the cancer patient of being a fool how dare you trust decades of scientific peer review and empirical evidence over random blogs written by people with no credentials over the internet yeah it's like this is the whole conspiracy theory thing in a nutshell though isn't it it's like yeah why would you believe the evidence when there's crazy people online to believe also you might be wondering well simon why aren't you showing the comic if you're watching on youtube why isn't the comic on screen why are you describing it in such depth and I'd be like, because comics are like famously, um, I don't know if it's this, this comic, maybe not, but there's, I think there are like, there's a comic I came across in the past and they're like famously hot on like, you can't show it at all. And it's like, but we, it's, it seems fine. <laughs> they're like, no! It's like, okay, okay, fine. That's why we're not showing the bloody comic. I'm sorry. I don't want to get a copyright strike. The owl's head appears topped by a dunce hat and the poor bird looks down in shame. And therein lies the malicious risk of the BCP theories. Though, if these messages are repeated often and convincingly enough, patients who are yet to experience the positive results of their current therapies may feel like foolish sheeple and decide to switch to an unproven, untested, unapproved alternative treatment. Or even worse, recently diagnosed patients may decide to eschew science altogether, opting for fad cures. Uh-oh, don't do that. Like, cancer? Once they, I remember a mate of mine had like ball cancer. He was like, I was like, what happened? And he was like, well, I was just, you know, making sure everything's okay. And he's like, oh, but everything's different today. That's not supposed to be there. So he went into the doctor and literally like the next day they had him in surgery. They were like, oh, we're chopping that right out. <laughs> it's like, holy shit, time matters. He wasn't like, oh yeah, let me try the turmeric. He was like, get me in the operating room. Take my ball out. He's fine, by the way. As far as I know, I haven't spoken to him in a few years. 
but I assume he's fine. <laughs> Testicular cancer is one of those ones where it's like, whoosh, they drop it off and you're all good. I believe, to have clearly stated my point of view on the conspiracy, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's break down exactly what the proponents of the BCP believe in. Secret cures. Every conspiratorial plot needs a powerful cabal of antagonists. In this case, it's the faceless amorphous entity defined as Big Pharma, a conglomerate of drug companies and their acolytes, namely unscrupulous physicians, research institutes, regulatory bodies, and government healthcare institutions. Ah, yes, all of those people, doctors and research scientists who are famous for wanting to keep us sick. According to the more widespread version of the theory, Big Pharma and friends have discovered some form of miraculous curative drug or medical device that can definitely beat cancer. But they keep it hidden to financially benefit from the sale of treatments which only partially treat the disease without eradicating it. Moreover, these treatments cause an array of serious adverse effects which lower the quality of life of cancer patients and require another host of medications such as painkillers. A common variant on the trope is that the silver bullet that can pierce through the heart of this mutant monster we call cancer is actually pretty simple. More often than not, it's a natural solution, a herbal remedy, a fruity extract, or a medical device which harnesses base physical phenomena such as electricity or magnetism to destroy cancer cells. Oh no, don't believe in this stuff. Don't do this. Just go to the doctor until like, it, it, I mean, it's not going to be good, but it's going to be better than this. Dr. Joseph Suarez, writing for McGill University's Office for Science and Society in 2017, compiled a series of claims collected from websites and newsletters claiming to offer such natural cures. According to their marketing campaigns, these cures are not widely known to the general public. More precisely, quote, You can't hear about these secrets from your doctor, but you shouldn't blame him because his hands are tied and he could even lose his license for recommending safe natural alternatives to toxic cancer drugs. What is dangerous is that many of the natural alternatives to corporate drugs can actually boast at least an initial kernel of clinical efficacy. Oh, okay. I didn't even expect that. I was like... <laughs> Turmeric, please. For example, an ointment called Curaderm BEC5, which claims to be based on eggplant extract and to cure basal cell cancer, a type of skin cancer. Well, according to the marketing material, one courageous MD, if your marketing material uses the word courageous, if you're ever reading something that has to do with medicine and it says courageous, you know it's a scam. Can you imagine going into the store and being like, oh yeah, no, I'll get some uh, aspirin, please. Yeah, yeah, no, the courageous one. It's a scam! No legitimate drugs would ever say courageous. Spent his career proving that nobody does it better than Mother Nature. This brave doctor developed a treatment with a 100% success rate backed by 80,000 cases. Schwaritz found that there is actually some limited anecdotal evidence of eggplant extract having some efficacy. But there are certainly no randomized, double-blind clinical trials demonstrating the efficacy and safety of Curaderm, which never received the necessary approval from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. In fact, in 2008, the FDA intimated the closure of the main website marketing the drug. <laughs> As much as I love eggplants, or aubergines as I prefer to call them, yes indeed, that's right, Phil, this side of the pond, I would rather have them layered with bechamel sauce and minced meat in a delicious moussaka than smeared over my skin. Next on the menu is fruit of the angels, or papaya to you and me. Papaya extracts have been observed to slow down the proliferation of cancer cells in a laboratory setting. But the same can be said for numerous other substances which did not translate their properties into a clinical setting. Yeah, it's like, I mean, bleach is gonna kill viruses in a laboratory setting. Inside your body, not so much. <laughs> In other words, it works in a petri dish, but it doesn't mean it will work inside a human body. Thank you. Dr. Schwartz was also spammed by quacks peddling shaga mushrooms. The evidence for their efficacy? A single reference in the book The Cancer Ward by Nobel laureate Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who won the academic prize for literature, not medicine. Oh, God. <laughs> You're like, hey, hey. Hemingway, <laughs> what do you think of this? And he's like, you wrote this in your book. And he's like, it's a fiction book. I'm a Nobel laureate in literature, you clowns. Another popular remedy is a diet high in apricot pits. This is an interesting case as apricot pits can be used to extract and synthesize the compound amygdalin, marketed as Latreville or vitamin B17, even though it's not a vitamin and there's no such thing as vitamin B17. The drug was once heralded as a miracle cure for cancer, again, based on limited anecdotal observations. As a piece of trivia here, one of the minor characters of the classic graphic novel Watchmen by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons 
Moloch the Mystic is a terminal cancer patient who tries amygdalin as a last-ditch effort to survive. Does it work? Tell me if it works! <laughs> it doesn't work, does it? Although it might work, it's a comic book. Going back to reality, in 1982, a study conducted by the Mayo Clinic on 178 patients on amygdalin showed that they all experienced cancer progression seven months after being treated. Moreover, several patients experienced symptoms of cyanide poisoning. Mmm, so shocking. It Eating apricot bits doesn't work, does it? <laughs> Weird. Lastly, in Triot's review of Hokum recipes, we can find Thunder God Vine, also known as the true cancer killer that stunned scientists by wiping out cancer in 40 days. Another thing, if your medication is marketing itself by what sounds like a YouTube video title, don't trust it, it's not real. The vine in question contains a compound called triptolide, which has some efficacy in a small cohort of patients. The only catch? They were laboratory mice, watching out for the quacks. The world of alternative cures is truly weird and wonderful. Mm, Phil, I don't know if it's wonderful, it's just weird and deceptive and conny. And it is astounding to read how many of these treatments have been peddled around the world by quacks and surprisingly endorsed by the general media on the hunt for a good story. Let's take the example of anti-neoplastons, a substance synthesized from urine by Dr. Stanislav R. Berzinski. In 1988, four cancer patients cured by anti-neoplastons were featured in the popular talk show The Sally Jesse Raphael Show, which clearly provided undeserved positive coverage to an untested drug. Following this and other TV appearances, several patients sought treatment with Dr. Berzinski. Then in 1992, a study proved that anti-neoplastons had no effect on tumoral cells. Shortly afterward, two of the patients who had appeared at Raphael's show were reported dead. Berzinski was later indicted for mail fraud and marketing of an unapproved drug. Ah, yes, because it's not real. In 1993, another popular show, 60 Minutes, featured a documentary about biochemist William Lane and his book, Sharks Don't Get Cancer. As you may have guessed, Lane's point was, well, sharks don't get cancer. Hence his support for the use of powdered shark cartilage as a cure. Wait, did this guy say he was a biochemist? Bro, just this, this is like some rhino horde shit. You can't just grind up the bones of an animal and be like, yeah, 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 because that animal doesn't have this disease, we just ground up its bones and fed it to you. Boom! Done! This is based on the idea that shark cartilage contains a protein which may inhibit angiogenesis, the process by which cancerous tumors develop new blood vessels to feed themselves. The process demonstrated modest anti-angiogenic properties in a lab setting, but no beneficial effects were proven in actual patients. Okay, so look, there is a little bit of logic behind it. He's a biochemist, okay? He's not just like, yeah, grind up the bones! But it doesn't work in people, apparently. Which is important when you're trying to create treat cancer in people. Nonetheless, 60 Minutes presented the case of 29 Cuban cancer patients purported to feel better after some cycles of cartilage therapy. In 1997, a study on shark cartilage was presented at the annual meeting of ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. The study followed 58 patients for a period of 12 weeks, reaching the conclusion that shark cartilage was inactive in patients with advanced stages of cancer, specifically in breast, colon, lung, and prostate cancer. Ironically, one of the funders of the study was cartilage Cartilage Technologies. Uh oh, a manufacturer of shark derived treatments. Oh, what is that contemplating to interest right there? After the ASCO debacle, Cartilage Technologies announced that it would support no additional research on shark cartilage. A second trial taking place in the year 2000 was funded by William Lane himself. Not that he wanted to, he was required to by the Federal Trade Commission after Lane had been making illegal claims about his shark based product, Benefin, since 1997. Unsurprisingly, also this second trial demonstrated no clinical benefit for tested patients. Wow, so the FTC are like, bro, you've been saying this? You gotta pay to prove it. And if you don't prove it, we're gonna find the shit out of you or whatever they did. Did they? I don't know, allegedly. Another fad treatment from the 1980s was Cancel, also known as Cantron and Protocell, and in theory, Cancel could lower the voltage of the cell structure by about 20% which somehow causes tumoral cells to digest themselves. In 1989, the FDA sought to analyze this portentous liquid, to which manufacturers replied that this was not possible. You see, Cancel's molecular structure changed constantly under the effect of atmospheric vibrations. Okay, you know what's not real? I mean, atmospheric vibrations are real, like sound is an atmospheric vibration, but it's not something that's going to change the properties of it. This is so woo-woo, it's not even the, F <laughs> the FDA be like, what the f are you talking about? No. The FDA had none of that bull 
and put cancer under the microscope, finding that it contains sulfuric acid and catahol, a molecule classified as a possible human carcinogen. <laughs> this was done by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. <laughs> The early days of the internet gave a boost to the promotion of medical devices as well as pseudo-pharmacological treatments. One of those was Zotron therapy, also known as the Cell Specific Cancer Theory or CSCT. This was a donut-shaped device which exposed patients to a magnetic field which could detect and destroy cancerous cells. The Zotron website, launched in 1997, advertised a fee of $20,000 payable in advance. Mm -mm. Don't do that. Patients would be treated at a specialist clinic in the Dominican Republic and later moved to Mexico. Have you not seen movies? Don't, like, I don't know, movies, TV shows, books, whatever. Like, if they're like, come to Mexico for the secret cure, there is no secret cure. They're just trying to rip you off. You boys like Mexico! The clinic was shut down in 2003 thanks to the intervention of Mexican, US, and Canadian authorities. Origins of a conspiracy. So, to recap, proponents of the big cancer plot believe the big pharma and crooked government officials either A have identified a cure for cancer but decided not to release it to protect revenue from other less effective treatments, and or B know very well that cancer can be cured via non-traditional medicine but actively ostracize these methods. Both notions would make for a great plot point in some techno-conspiracist thriller by the likes of Michael Crichton or Dan Brown. Perhaps the boardrooms of pharma companies have been infiltrated by members of the New World Jesuitic Illuminati Freeman Order of the Bohemian Grove, whose end goal is to line their pockets and perhaps cull world population to more manageable levels. Yeah, sounds realistic, doesn't it? As an aside, I've always been amused by conspiracy theories revolving around this idea of a demographic cull. Well, Phil, if you want to write some more, maybe there's one to crack on with. As of 2023, this planet is trodden on by almost 8 billion poor sods. So, apparently, these secret societies really suck at their job. The problem is, a good portion of said sods are always keen to keep believing in these kinds of stories. According to a survey conducted by Worldwide Cancer Research, more than a quarter of Americans believe the BCP to be absolutely true. One? What? One in, one in four? What? <laughs> While one in seven believe it might be true. That's a total of almost 40% of American citizens or part who totally or partially believe that a cancer cure exists, but it's being hidden from them. Are you smoking the crack? That's incredible, America. Once established that this belief is alive, kicking and widespread, we should understand how it originated. According to physicist and science writer David Robert Grimes, the belief that a cure for cancer is being withheld by vested interests is a long-standing one. It is often used as a universal do ex machina for those pushing an alternative alleged cure. Grimes cites a medical paper dating back to 1980 in which the authors debunk the upteenth miracle secret cure at that time supported by that bible of credible scientific information. Penthouse magazine. <laughs> There's an article published to say, Why are you buying Penthouse? Oh, I'm not interested in cures for cancer. That's why I'm buying Penthouse magazine for the potential cancer cures. I like reading it for the articles. But an article published by Cancer Research UK proves that alternative cures have been peddled as early as the 1910s, supported by the claim that official medical science is trying to bury them to protect the only available treatment at the time surgery. Finally, according to Michael Simpson writing for SkepticalRaptor.com, it's clear that a lot of the secret cancer cure myths arise in the typical pseudoscience websites. They're pushing natural cures that are 100% effective in curing every known cancer with no known side effects. I like you, Michael Simpson. I like the fact that you have a website called Skeptical Raptor, you legend. So there is no clear single origin point to the BCP, but most authors seem to agree that it is part and parcel with marketing strategies employed by manufacturers alternative cures. I have to say, I'm not properly paying attention because I keep thinking back to the fact that a quarter of Americans believe this, which is nuts. Like, there's probably, that's, that's going to be people in the comments being like, Ah, uh, Simon, actually, <laughs> about this. Like, holy in other words, unscrupulous or self-proclaimed doctors came up with a silver bullet and to support the lack of clinical evidence, they spread the myth that Big Pharma doesn't want patients to know the truth. From then on, the myth took on a life of its own, separating into the two strands we described earlier. Author Robert Blaskiewicz of the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire 
uh, contends that version A of the myth, the one in which farmer found a cure but hid it, finds fertile soil amongst patients, caregivers, and relatives who have to experience long, often excruciating therapies, often resulting in painful death. Which is an understandable feeling. Cancer is a disease caused by exposure to certain environmental conditions, abuse of certain substances, or unhealthy lifestyle choices. However, it is also known to be caused by genetic factors or infection by pathogens such as the human papillomavirus. It is a part of our nature to seek explanations when chaos and suffering strike at us and our loved ones. And very often, looking for an explanation means looking for someone, anyone to blame. Refuting Conspiracist The Hidden Cure this topic is certainly no laughing matter, but this section is arguably the most fun one. The one where we break down and destroy the arguments of the conspiracy theorists. Let's first tackle Strand A. Big Pharma found the cure, but they're hiding it from us. The already quoted Robert David Grimes in his paper on the viability of conspiratorial beliefs est estimated that a secret discovery of this magnitude would involve, at the barest minimum, some 714,000 people across multiple biotechs, pharma companies, research institutes, hospitals, and government institutions. Grimes used statistical models based on how long it took to unearth conspiracies which proved to be true, and he estimated that such an army of pharma or pharma-adjacent personnel would barely last 3.17 years before somebody spilled the beans. One may argue, fine, but what about if the secret cure was discovered by one single company with no other entity involved? Well, here we can offer two counter-arguments. But before I proceed, I believe I should mention my qualifications on the topic. I'm not a medical professional, pharmacist, nor biochemist, but in a previous professional incarnation, I developed dossiers on new cancer drugs to be submitted to regulatory and funding bodies, so I acquired a good working knowledge of how cancer functions and especially how treatments are developed and brought to patients. Okay, so extra qualified are we, Phil, for this one? I'm not involved in the sector any longer, by the way. I'm now the proud author of technical manuals for help desks supporting users of project management software. You may recognize my name from classics, such classics as Section 3.1b, Removing Unassigned Tasks from Simplified Project Templates and Kanban Boards, Collapsed View. This is so, like, this is your day job? It's so, it's so different from this kind of writing. First of all, we have to understand what cancer is. Cancer is not a single disease. Cancer is an umbrella term encompassing a group of diseases in which abnormal cell growth, triggered by a mutation, invades healthy tissues and organs. Types of cancer are usually identified by the organ they affect – lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, brain cancer, and so on. Each type can be divided into several subtypes, each characterized by a specific mutation. Academic research does not agree on the different number of cancer types, with Cancer Research UK quoting a figure of more than 200. Each one of these would require a different therapeutic approach in order to reach some degree of efficacy. All therapies currently used had to go through a rigorous process comprising preclinical in vitro research as well as three phases of clinical trials before they're approved by a governmental regulatory bodies such as the FDA. Phase 3 trials require for the experimental therapy to be tested in a large enough cohort of patients so as to achieve results that are statistically significant. In other words, results which we can safely say are not due to chance. The cohort of patients receiving the experimental drug must be matched by an equally sized patient cohort receiving a comparator drug or a placebo if a comparator drug does not exist. In certain types of cancer, especially the rarer ones, it takes years before a suitable number of patients is identified and recruited. I apologize for a long-winded introduction, but here comes my point. To identify a drug that cures all types of cancers, a pharma company would need to recruit tens of thousands of patients afflicted by all types of cancer across hundreds of hospitals worldwide and rigorously test the outcomes of the therapy before they could safely claim, Aha! We found it, folks! This mechanism in itself means that thousands and thousands of people would necessarily be involved in the research process, even if it was conducted by a single company, thus multiplying the chances for somebody to blow the whistle. And then we come to our second counter-argument. Clinical trials and the research process in general are enormously expensive. The average cost of bringing one drug from preclinical research to phase 3 results has been estimated at $1.3 billion by the London School of Economics. Theoretically, trialing a cure for all 200 types of cancer would mean that was multiplied by 200. Holy shit, that's a lot of money. I know how expensive this is. Like, back in the day when I was a student, I would uh, test drugs. Like, in the in the early clinical trials, where you just go and stay in a hospital for like a week or two. And they'd be like, take this experimental drug. And you're like, okay. And then they pay you a lot of money. And you're like, brilliant. I'm on drugs. <laughs> So, our nefarious and secretive pharma company would invest $200 billion and then stash their miracle compound into a vault away from the prying, tearful eyes of millions of patients. 
Now, it's not my job to defend big pharmaceutical corporations. Some of them have proven to behave unethically, to say the least, on numerous occasions, and they have sizable legal departments so they can look after themselves. But they are for-profit enterprises. Some may argue that they are uncaring or even evil, but they're not stupid. So why would they stash their cure away from their main customers, the departments of health or private insurance companies, willing to fund new, effective treatments? A proponent of the big cancer plot may contend that a definitive cure for cancer may erode revenue from existing therapies. But let's take a look at those existing therapies, shall we? Most cancer types are now treated with chemotherapy or more innovative compounds such as tyrosine kinase inhibitors, monoclonal antibodies, or immuno-oncology regimens. All of these therapies have in common the fact that the patients initially show some response at the size of their primary tumors and metastases begin to shrink. A fraction of them may experience complete remission. Sadly, a large percentage will experience tumor progression after some years or just months on therapy. When a treatment fails, normally a doctor would prescribe a second-line therapy and then a third line and a fourth if available. Each subsequent line of therapy would normally be manufactured by a different company, meaning that no individual pharma player will gain revenue from the entire treatment pathway, but only from a fraction of it. Patients may remain on treatment for several years, undergoing several cycles of therapy, each cycle of therapy consisting of one pack of a certain drug which a hospital pharmacy would purchase from the Saar Pharmaceutical Company. In most European countries, the government would foot the bill, but sometimes patients will have to fund treatment via their insurance or out of their own pockets, which I understand is a normal process in the US. So, in the current situation, a pharma company would gain an X amount of revenue depending on the cycles of therapy undergone by each patient until they progress to the next line of therapy. On the other hand, a theoretical miracle cure may restrict such revenue streams to just one cycle per patient. The drug does its magic and boom, cancer's gone, patient is healed, no more money pours in. Right? Well, no, not really. The assumption does not take into account that cancerous cells are highly proliferative and adaptive. That is why it's so difficult to kill them off for good. An all-encompassing cancer cure, however miraculous, would probably take more than one cycle of therapy before achieving total remission. The other consideration is the incidence of new cancer patients. And by incidence, we mean the number of new patients being diagnosed over a given time period, typically a year. According to Cancer Research UK, the annual worldwide incidence for all types of cancer is 28 million. This means that our nefarious pharma company, were it to come out of the vault and patent its cure, would have access to a pool of 25 million patients every year, each of whom would require several cycles of therapy. It would be absolutely in that big pharma company's interest interest to patent that bad boy ASAP and go to market fast. Yes, of course, even when you, like, that argument that I came up with when I started was like, oh, there's more money in the treatment, clearly been debunked. And there's another point to consider speed. Each new medicinal compound must be patented, and the patent lasts 20 years from the date of filing. This date can occur several years before a drug is approved by a government and can therefore be prescribed. Once a patent expires, any other company can manufacture and market a generic version which will erode sales from the original branded version. This means that sometimes pharma companies only have a handful of years before loss of exclusivity in which they can recoup the costs invested in clinical trials. Now, after completing my first draft, of this piece, I discussed these counter-arguments with my wife and two of my friends who are retorted with a possible conspiracy theory that are not considered thus far. What if a single pharma company discovers a cure for cancer, but a panel of competitors pressures them into not releasing it? And here's the thing. The arrival of an innovative and disruptive drug onto a market does not immediately wipe out the competition, at least not in the chemical, pharmaceutical, and technological sectors. Surely it would if it was a cure. If someone was like, do you want to try chemotherapy or do you want the cure? I'd be like, I will take the cure, thank you very much. <laughs> The launch of a cure would instead create a new market. Research and development departments within competitors would hurl themselves at their supervisors and finance colleagues, baying for additional funds. If company A were to discover the first cure for cancer, competitors B and C would hope to get a slice of the action with the adequate backing and investments from the boardroom. Potentially, our research friends at B and C could hope to identify a new curative molecule, one with fewer adverse effects, for example, or one that does it faster, or one that does it faster with fewer adverse events in a specific subset of patients. This happens all the time in other classes of drugs and therapy areas, so I would realistically expect the same dynamics to take place here. One of my friends is the argumentative kind, who starts every sentence with, I see your point, and then follows it up with a but as big as Belgium. In this case, he retorted, what if competitors B, C, and so on would be unwilling or unable to develop their own cancer cure? Wouldn't it still be in their interest to ostracize company A? 
If that were the case, B and C would have another option. Sit on their hands and wait for some 10 to 15 years, maybe less. As I explained earlier, eventually the patents for the miracle cure will expire, and every farmer boss will have a slice of the pie by launching their own generic version. Refuting Conspiracy – The Natural Cure Okay, now allow me to recap the counter-arguments to strand A of the BCP. Identifying an effective cure for all types of cancer would involve thousands of people in any case, thus making it nigh impossible to keep it a secret, and it would still cost billions of dollars, making it incredibly simple not to market it as quickly as possible. Finally, its arrival onto the market would open profitable possibilities for the entire sector, not just one company. So let's move on to strand B, according to which Big Pharma is trying to suppress natural and alternative cures to cancer. As we've seen from our overview of the most infamous non-traditional remedies, it is not Big Pharma who actively oppose these treatments, but rather independent regulators and government institutions. And they do so only where the product in question is proven to be toxic and or marketed without the necessary license, which is what you would expect from them. Brian Dunning Science writer for Skeptoid, excellent, points out that several natural remedies are anyhow available as they may theoretically be harmless. Harmless, that is, until they're used to substitute medically prescribed therapies. But even in that case, Dunning states that Big Pharma doesn't suppress natural cures. Natural products are widely available. You can buy them in any supermarket, pick any natural compound you can think of, and you will find someone that sells it. Interestingly, the market for these products in the U.S. is almost as big as the one for FDA-approved drugs. Quote, In 2017, they, Americans, will spend just under $40 billion on unapproved drugs, a number which grows strongly each year. The market for FDA-approved drugs is 11 times as big, just under $450 billion, but since insurance pays for the majority of that, what Americans pay out of pocket is actually about the same. Our super skeptical friend Dunning brings up another interesting point to debunk the myth that Big Pharma suppresses natural remedies. To put it simply, several compounds patented by pharma companies start as molecules found in, well, nature. What both pharma and independent research labs do is extract the active ingredient and synthesize it in a controlled process to ensure homogeneity in terms of purity and dosage. Dunning's point of view is reinforced by Dr. Stephen Novella, professor of neurology and president of the New England Skeptical Society, who says, Some conspiracy theorists claim that drug companies ignore natural substances that cannot be patented and therefore cannot be profitable. However, if a natural substance is found useful, drug companies can develop related chemicals that are more effective. How should we respond to conspiracists? According to my word counter, I've been waffling for some 4,000 words and I hope I haven't bored you too much, Simon. No, this is one of my favorite episodes. I think this is like, it's just super interesting how this whole thing works. But don't worry, we're getting to the close. The last topic that I'd like to tackle is how can we respond to proponents of the big cancer plot? My advice would, of course, to be to point them to this video or podcast, but it's unlikely that the irrationally prone may be attracted to a long-winded rational explanation. Another possible argument to throw into the mix is that several types of cancers are, in fact, already cured, or more precisely, certain cancer types such as childhood leukemia, once a death sentence, now have a five-year survival rate which exceeds 90%. And the mortality rate from all cancer types has declined 25% over the past 20 years. That's incredible. 20 years ago was basically 2004, which is a long time ago, but also, like, not that long. And 25% drop is amazing. And things can only get better from now on. This is how humanity, in general, has evolved since the dawn of time. After all, through experimentation, observation, and identification of replicable results. I know it doesn't sound as exciting or miraculous, but there is hope for the future, fueled by rigorous, lengthy, expensive, and heavily regulated research. And maybe that's just what conspiracists are after. Hope. That dog in the cartoon I described at the beginning, he may make Al feel like a dunce, but probably he's the more damaged one. Maybe as a friend, loved one, or relative who died from cancer, despite them being treated with the latest licensed drug. Feel free to shut me down, but I can't help but feeling a glimmer of compassion towards the hippie dogs out there. Nonetheless, the owls of this world should absolutely not listen to this nonsense nor feel like dunces, but surely they don't need me, some online rando, to tell them that. Owls should continue what they're doing, kicking cancer where the sun doesn't shine, like the brave, bold, bright, badasses that they are. And that's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed it, make sure you uh, leave a great review, a rating on Spotify. All of that stuff definitely helps. If you're watching on YouTube, hello, like and subscribe. Share it with a friend. I'll see you next time.